So that takes us to our next segment. Every week we have a reoccurring segment, which is your moment of Braben. This one is brought to you from Games Kong 2016. So it's five years old. This is an interview on the importance of scientific accuracy. So looking at the clip, we're going to watch it and then go around the horn and discuss things that we found that match or do not match that sentiment. So we're going to talk about the science of Elite Dangerous now. And Elite Dangerous has presented such a wonderful opportunity to explore what what the galaxy, what the science is really like, and to get across all sorts of wonderful elements of it. I mean, people have heard endlessly that we've got a huge galaxy with 400 billion star systems. And, you know, some people have said it should be 300 billion star systems, for example. But... Um, the beauty with science is you have to go on the best theories. And if you look at observations of, um, of the galaxy uh, and the, the total mass of it, the figure we came up with was much closer to 400 billion when we tried simulating it. But this is the beauty with science, an exciting thing with science. But the point is you can visit all those systems, as a lot of people have. Um, I find absolutely amazing that it's a tiny fraction of 1% of the star systems have been visited by players. And that's after we've been, you know, more than 18 months now um, live in the world. There is The galaxy is so prodigiously big and so full of interesting things yet, you know, yet to be seen by people. Um, the game's been around for a long time. We've got 2.2 coming um, in not too long now, um, which obviously we're all excited about. And I think the um, just talking about that, you know, the, the galaxy, one of the um, frustrations for me from a science point of view is we haven't done all the things we can do in the science and we're improving it all the time. So for 2.2, we have white dwarfs, we have neutron stars, much better represented. We've been a lot of, done a lot of modeling of the, the magnetic fields, um, something called synchron synchrotron radiation, which is accelerating jets out from the interaction between the magnetic uh, pole and the rotational pole. So if I sort of animate it, you actually have something like a spinning top going around. And that causes particles to jet out. Uh, and it looks very different depending on the individual star. And it's trying to get the, the variation, you know, when you sort of you, you come out of supercruise, you see the different stars. I actually find um, white dwarfs quite dangerous because you don't realise just how close you are to them and for a, a few seconds, a few dangerous seconds. So those sort of things, they, they look different. They, of course, um, there's much more variation to them. There's the discovery effect of them. But with all of these things as well, it's how they affect gameplay, how they affect the sort of feeling of geography, the sense of where you are. And there are a lot of things as well coming, you know, that um, I've talked about the galaxy and, and dust and uh, the sort of the genuine science that we've been doing that when we put together the galaxy, it was way too bright. So we've had to add lots and lots of dust, which you can see in the in the sky as you fly around. And <clears throat> that dust dims the galactic core and also dims the whole galaxy and gives a distant perspective, where, depending on where you are above and below the galactic plane. Um, but that's a lot more than I think science suggests should be there. So it, it, our galaxy is evolving, but it's evolving based on the science, but creates a wonderfully rich backdrop People have asked me, why bother with scientific accuracy? And I'm sure they have a point. Uh, it, scientific accuracy really matters to me. But it, I know it matters to a lot of other people as well. It's, it's like the difference between a, a fantasy or a fictional story where there's no grounding in reality or to one where the setting might be the Second World War or might be the, you know, it might be some historical event that has meaning, even though elements of it are crafted above that as, as fiction. And I think, so for me, for me personally, it makes a big difference, but I think it also doesn't hurt. Why not make it a realistic background? I think it gives lots of new vectors for gameplay as well, you know, whether it's the heat mechanics in ships where you get sort of new approaches that are based on real life and fact. But, you know, even that aside, it's an interesting gameplay mechanic. I mean, what we've done with Elite Dangerous is the science is providing great ways of, um, of having the gameplay, of creating the variation, creating the geography, creating the differences. You know, looking at um, from planetary rings and the different styles there, the different things you can discover, um, to 
you know, the wider things, what the systems, how the sizes of the systems, what, what's there. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's more and more to come, more and more detail. But to me, it matters because I, I love that side of things. I love the, almost the excuse to do it. But it's great because it does serve gameplay. <laughs> Tectonics is something that we have done some modelling for, even in 2.0, but it's improved in 2.1, but is getting much better, and it determines the locations of the volcanism. For, for those who don't know, uh, as planets form, if you think of the, the planets starting off as covered in liquid, and then elements like eggshells form of hard sections of, of plates, those then float around on the lava. And Earth is still like that, deep underground. There are these giant tectonic plates that all slowly move. And at the boundaries is where you get uh, volcanoes and volcanism. Um, and you get upwellings of lava and all sorts of things. That applies even to really cold planets, except it's not necessarily molten rock. It might be molten um, CO2, molten water. Uh, there are all sorts of different chemistries where the lava might be something like water, which very quickly hardens into ice. Um, and it has different properties, but essentially it's the same sort of thing. It, they're still volcanoes, it's still volcanism. So they're called geysers and all sorts of other things, because often it jets out into space, and we can see that in our own solar system. But by our modelling, it's actually very, very common. And so those are the sort of things that are coming to 2.2 that you'll see. But those are also the things as it jets out the water or whatever the substance is, nitrogen, you know, that um, it carries up other things with it from deep within the planet. And those are the rares that you can discover. So they're not just brought in from outside by meteorites. So lots and lots of fun things um, to come. Very, very exciting with respect to that. Um, in terms of other things, the, obviously there's much more science to come. Um, the, because what we're doing is so, so vast, you know, we have much more plans for populating things. Um, I've mentioned atmospheres. Obviously, you know, that's something that is on our roadmap to come. And the, what I've always wanted with these is to do them properly. And they're, you know, to do them essentially in a sensible way that serves the story and the background and the gameplay. Um, one of the things that we always are trying to do is to advance the gameplay and to make sure there are lots of things for different styles of play. You know, I mentioned exploration, combat. It's quite obvious how the science works there. You know, the key thing is... Um, you know, the scanner works by electromagnetic emissions, so basically radiation. And we all radiate. You know, right now we're radiating heat in mostly in the infrared band, and it therefore very, very easy to detect. Spaceships are the same. Um, even you know, through from since World War Two, it's been very, very normal. If you look at um, modern combat, for example, with image intensifiers, how easy it is, it is to see a hot tank from a distance. So all sorts of things. Are, happen where um, on, you know, even tanks from the 70s, where they have um, what, what's often called infragreen, which is image intensification. Um, there is a button you can press on the trigger of a even as late as, as, as old as a chieftain, which puts goes to full infrared where they have an arc light spotlight which highlights the scene it can be used to target and then when re they release the button a steel shutter comes across it to hide the infrared radiation because it can be used by the other guys to target now we do the same in elite dangerous we have shutters over the, the cooling vents um, but the cooling vents are really important in space because you can't easily get rid of heat other than by radiating it so it you know this whole stealth mechanic of basically holding your breath, holding the you know closing the vents and all that sort of thing, was is very very effective. So th the point with this is is you know we get st stealth gameplay from science if you like, but the point with this is the science is at the root of it, and makes the gameplay interesting, makes the gameplay varied, and makes the gameplay different to other games. So I'm really really proud of what we've done, what the excellent team here at Frontier have done. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you're playing with us. If, you, if you're just watching these videos for the first time, come and join us. It's great fun. Thank you. All right. So there you heard it from the man himself. And he's talking about why scientific accuracy is important in Elite Dangerous. Now, I want to start off with an observation that I've made, which is I am absolutely in love with 
the work that Dr. K has done with regard to the planet tech. I'm talking about Linne, Palimpsest, cryovulcanism. Yes, yes, that shit is legit. Uh, and, and the different things that they're done. I know that it's rough with regard to the crystal forest, but the scattering of the materials to make it to where everything on the planet isn't just in three discrete locations, but it kind of is spread everywhere. That is amazing. And I think that that is a huge step towards scientific realism that is being added with Odyssey. I know there's some things that people are going to bring up that are on the other side of this column, but I just wanted to start it off with one positive that I think is a huge step forward for scientific accuracy in Odyssey. Who wants to start us off on the other end of the spectrum or just whatever other observations? It could be a positive thing. Go ahead, Roy. So uh, first, let me mention uh, from the chat, uh, Commander uh, Maskim ECC. Oh, right. Maskim E. Hello. Maskim. Bonjour brought up a point that a number of people have agreed to, including myself, which is that everyone just loves the passion in the eyes of Mr. Braben when he's talking about this this game. Always. It's it's so awesome just to see that. It's such a such a impact, especially which you know, to add to whatever topic he's talking about. But yeah, talking about scientific accuracy, um I had a couple things to bring up, both around uh, trying to breathe in space. And uh, the first one, you know, we've talked about before and I think a number of other uh, folks have mentioned it in the past too, but this the space cowboy, you know, the guy with the cowboy hat uh, that was at the salvage mission and no helmet. Um, that that's obviously a, an immersion breaking <clears throat> thing to see something like that. And I, to to even go beyond that, I would say um, the the point of how long can we breathe uh, in our suits when we're outside of the ship or outside of the SRV? I I take issue with that as well. I mean, it's in, it's measured in minutes. That the time it takes your battery to run down and then and then you suffocate and yes you can extend it with packs and i hope it gets extended with engineering or something because if you just look at what nasa uses right now the eva suits right now last eight hours now granted they're big they're bulky but this is 2021 um and some some fraction of eight hours you would think is achievable with a smaller pack in the future that's that's my couple points with regard to the space cowboys just seeing people running around on airless moons with cowboy hats that oof hashtag oof switch uh, whether or not cowboy hats are going to be available in the game which i'm really hoping they are I, I think that it's more of them kind of pushing into like the like going from established science to like potentially like more grounded like star trek science you know like trying to stick with like hard science so that's what in my brain that's what i tell myself when i'm looking at the the kind of like sketchy stuff in the game when it comes to like like what roy is talking about with you know how long could you survive on a planet with just a single person suit i'm trying to give them a little more leeway there so it doesn't break the immersion so much you know in my mind anyway uh, i totally get that but you for sure need a helmet on an airless moon yeah that's not how science works uh, any other observations? We said, we've talked about this before, and I've been mm -hmm. on the record saying I, I, I kind of believe that we should have artificial gravity in 3307. But since we don't, for the love of God, all these streams I'm seeing, people walking around these tin can stations, and there's pizza boxes laying on the floor, and soda cans or cups laying on the floor, and, and they're walking around without a problem. I mean, either invent gravity or don't and fix the art. I, something has to happen there. That's To me, that's totally totally immersion breaking yeah we've well covered the zero g stations being uh a little weird because they're not in any way as far as the art department is concerned any other observations on scientific either accuracies or inaccuracies from odyssey i've got one for Go movement in in low g Let, let's let's take the station argument out let's let's go to go to the planets that we've all been to and now we can go to even more you know we, we've got severely low g planets and we've got severely high g planets but you know just going to the low g stuff where you know i've been out at the crystal forest recently stocking up um i i hit one of those little shards off and i watch it dink up and float around and then either i can jump up and go at it in the srv or i just wait for it to fall and it takes forever but in odyssey you walk around like you're a boss and you magically have one g and you're not having to bounce and hop and skip and not run too fast or not jump too hard or whatnot because especially on these super low grav um planets that we're on it wouldn't be that hard to throw yourself off the ground with a good jump and possibly reach escape velocity 
Um, that bugs me. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we've all seen we've all seen the you know moon videos, the stuff from the '60s of you know Buzz and Neil running around on the moon, and they look somewhere between like a drunken toddler and like Godzilla, sort of where you're like, oh, you're kind of w- moving this weird sort of sideways skippity hippity hoppity kind of whatever, and that was in one sixth G. So that's you know what 17 percent G. As opposed to we're going on planets that are 0.001 or 0.005, way less gravity than that. And you're sort of just moving and running and walking completely normal. On that one, I'll be honest, on that one, I'm a little more inclined to give Frontier leeway on that and say, like, if you have to call, like draw a line between this is scientifically accurate and this is fun gameplay, I definitely understand and respect making the choice to lean in towards the fun gameplay. So that one I can kind of whatever, but I would like for them to give a just the same way as you can't hear anything in space, but we hear explosions in our ship and the lore in lore in game lore in universe way that they've explained that is to say your computer generates sounds because when they started space flight in the 20th century and like many 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 you know through the years they found that human brain doesn't deal well with seeing an explosion and not hearing it so it makes you feel a little disoriented so they put ai into the ships to display or or in this case produce a sound a an a fake sound to, you know, sort of account for that. And obviously, faster than light travel is is the thing that David Braben said when they first put out the game. This is the one lie that you have to buy into. This is the one thing that we're going to do that's fake. And it facilitates the gameplay for the rest of the game. But as NASA has just put out two different, they've, they've got two different papers that they're under review now where they are re-examining the idea of an Alcubierre drive uh, of faster than light travel. Potentially, possibly a realistic prospect, but it requires the it, both of the different papers sort of require the utilization of dark matter and like who knows how that's going to work out but you're talking thousands of years and a thousand years in the future so maybe whatever but David Braben said when they first put out Elite Dangerous faster than light travel is the one thing that they're just like hey turn off your brain and go with it everything else we're going to make accurate this is the one thing that for gameplay fun purposes we're just going to go with Roy you saw something interesting in the chat yeah, in Twitch chat, uh, Fresh Baklava eighty one brought up a question that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, has FDev said if they're going to update the real life gal- galactic data we have in game? So updates of the galaxy map. And my initial response was, you know, I think they've done some of that. They the have, past, but they haven't made any uh, visionary statements about continuing to do it, even though there's more and more information that we've reviewed yeah. some of it in real life science and so forth. They have in the past. Here's the one that gets hairy. Like they can do a lot of that and they can they can incorporate a lot of that information here's the one that they're sort of damned if they do damned if they don't and i think it's probably honestly in in all reality better if they just leave scientists over the last two years have more or less established i mean this is a thing that they suspected for some time but they've had peer-reviewed papers that have gotten to six sigma who where they say flat out like yes we are two thousand light years closer to sag a to the closer to the center of the galaxy than we previously had thought that we were. Here is the part where it's entirely unfair of Frontier to expect them to change that. We have the whole area between us and SAG-A mapped out. We have systems, we have places that have been like they have been explored, that people have names on planets and systems, people have mapped stuff, people have encountered stuff, people have said like, hey, here's a weird site where there's a there's a Thargoids or a, a Guardian site here. Here's a here's a Selenium place here. Here's a whatever there. If they were to just overnight sort of move us 2000 light years closer to sag you're going to have to cut stuff. And there's no good way for them to do that without really risking pissing off people who are like, hey, man, I found that thing and you took it away from me. So with regard to that one specific thing, I think we just kind of got to let it go. Maybe I mean, they're smarter than me, so maybe they can come up with some way that fits. But I don't know, man, that that that's a rough one.